In the early days of the Famicom, games could only hold up to 40 kilobytes of ROM space. This meant that games had to be smaller in size and more simplistic. But with the standards changing and developers demanding more space, the maximum allowance would be increased. But what actually is the largest NES game? The answer will surprise you. Let's take a look. going on? It's Poger coming at you with another video. You notice anything different? Alright, if you've seen a couple of my videos and you like what I do, hit the subscribe button right there. And don't forget to check out our Discord server, discord.poger.net. I'll also put a link in the description. Alright, let's talk about the biggest NES game. Famicom game cartridges could only hold up to 32 kilobytes of PRG memory and 8 kilobytes of CHR memory, which is the graphics data, totaling to 40 kilobytes. This was a perfectly reasonable limit at the time. Donkey Kong Jr. didn't need more than 40 kilobytes, and it was the best console version at the time. The native limits of the Famicom were perfectly fine for early arcade ports and smaller single-screen games. Nintendo would make a breakthrough with Super Mario Bros. Despite only having 40 kilobytes to work with, they were able to make a massive game. This wasn't just a single screen, these were horizontally scrolling levels and multiple of them. But this game really ate up all the NES's resources and was the best you could do with such a low amount of ROM space. Knowing that 40 kilobytes would not be enough long term, Nintendo designed the Famicom and NES to support enhancement chips. These are chips that go inside the cartridge and boost the capabilities of the game beyond the hardware's normal limits. Companies in Japan were making their own enhancement chips, also known as mappers, but Nintendo of America had their own approved chips that had to be used. You weren't allowed to use your own mappers. One of the first mappers approved by Nintendo was CN-ROM. This allowed for bank switching, which essentially gave you 64 kilobytes of total ROM space. This is a small improvement over the original 40 kilobytes. One game that benefited from this chip was Adventure Island. It's a platformer where you just walk to the right. You start off completely defenseless, but you can obtain the hammer which lets you hit enemies. You can also grab the skateboard, but it's a double-edged sword. It does grant you an extra hit, but you can't stop moving. There are secret items which can be found by using your hammer. These can include special weapon upgrades or a bonus stage. The level design is very linear, but I like that. There's almost never any paths you can go, you just follow the road to the end. I'm not a big fan of exploration type games, so I prefer this. The game has a lot of diagonal scrolling across the stages. The NES typically had trouble doing this, so I respect that Hudson was able to pull it off. Despite the mapper though, the developers still had to cut corners to save space. The game reuses a lot of background graphics, but with a different color palette. Most of the level layouts were recycled later in the game, but with minor changes. The bosses look and behave identical, but with small differences. Even with 64 kilobytes of ROM space to work with, the developers still had trouble keeping the game within that threshold. The size of games would be increased further with the UN ROM mapper. This gave developers the ability to create 128 kilobyte games. This allowed for excellent titles like 1943, Castlevania, Contra, DuckTales, Life Force, and others. So what can you do with 128 kilobytes of ROM space? You do get a decent bang for your buck with Contra. It's a shoot 'em up where you walk to the right and defeat the boss at the end. Along the way, you can collect weapon upgrades that help you out. While the game does not have as many stages as Adventure Island, it also doesn't reuse any assets. Every stage looks different from one another, and the graphics are well detailed. This game really does showcase what you can do with 128 kilobytes of ROM space, considering how limited the NES Donkey Kong was, for example. However, even Contra had to be scaled down to meet that 128 kilobyte requirement. In Japan, Konami was able to include more content in that version of Contra. There's animated background graphics and cutscenes in between stages. But because Konami had to settle for the UN ROM mapper instead of their own, they had to remove content from the US version. Even 128 kilobytes wasn't always enough for developers, so how far can you go from here? Later on, Nintendo would manufacture some more mappers that gave companies more flexibility so they didn't have to sacrifice so much content. The MMC-1 mapper allowed for 256 kilobyte games. We're really starting to get into the high numbers. Remember that the NES could only support up to 40 kilobytes without a mapper. This mapper was used in games like Adventures of Lolo, Blaster Master, 
Bubble Bobble, Ninja Turtles, Metroid, and others. It's worth mentioning that it wasn't always the best decision to use Elias Mapper. Money was a big factor for game companies and the better mappers were more expensive. If you don't need 256 kilobytes, you might be better off saving money and using a mapper that supports less space. It doesn't matter what year the game came out either. Some later releases did use less powerful mappers because it made more sense financially. It's also worth mentioning that sometimes games will receive underpowered mappers. The most infamous example is Dragon's Lair. The gameplay is extremely slow and laggy because the US version received the UN ROM mapper. But in Japan, the game was bundled with the MMC3 mapper, which we'll talk about in a second. This version is much quicker and more fluent. This game really had no business using the UN ROM mapper. Nintendo would really make a breakthrough with that MMC3 mapper. This one not only increased the amount of ROM space, but also allowed for easier split-screen effects. Many games that used the MMC3 mapper will feature overlapping backgrounds and other cool effects. But the mapper gave developers a ridiculous amount of ROM space to work with, and as a result, we will see some incredible games. Unlike its predecessor, Adventure Island 2 used the MMC3 mapper, and we'll see some major changes in this one. The core concept is the same. You start off with no weapon, and you collect a hammer. The skateboard is here too, but now you can ride the dinosaurs. The levels are bigger in size and scroll in multiple directions. The game no longer recycles the same levels over and over again, and there's multiple paths you can take. The bosses are also different in each island. The graphics are way more detailed, and there's more terrain in this one than the original. Adventure Island 3 also uses the MMC3 mapper. This one isn't much different from the last game. They added a new dinosaur that can perform somersaults. There's also some stage backgrounds that were in the previous games and new music. One improvement they made was in the bosses. In the previous game, your dinosaur buddy would try to help you fight the boss, but this feature was not implemented well and most of the time your buddy ends up shooting at nothing. In this game though, they removed that feature completely. Thank god for that. Unfortunately, this iteration feels more like a ROM hack of the previous game than its own standout title. Most of the graphics and music have been recycled from Adventure Island 2 and it hardly feels like a new game. It's still a fun experience though. Both of these games are 256 kilobytes in size, so theoretically they could have used the MMC1 mapper, but they might have benefited from the other features of the MMC3 one. I can't talk about the MMC3 mapper without discussing Super Mario Bros. 3. This game really shows what the chip can do. Not only are there 90 levels total, making it the biggest Mario game on the console, but there's a lot of features. There's 8 worlds, each of which have its own level map that you can maneuver around in. There's also mini games you can play that give you extra lives and toad houses that give you a power up. The game keeps track of all the items in your inventory box which you can use at the start of a level. The levels themselves can also be very big. It's the first Mario game to scroll in multiple directions. You're getting a lot of content with this game, so it's no wonder it's 384 kilobytes in size. You would think games couldn't get any bigger than that, but Konami would push the MMC3 map or more. Both of the Ninja Turtles beat-em-up games are 512 kilobytes and are large games. The second game is a port of the arcade one, but adds two extra levels that weren't in that version, making it the larger game. Ninja Turtles 3 is an astonishingly big game. Every single level looks different from the last, with not even a single background graphic being reused. The game also utilizes a lot of cool MMC3 effects, like the moving water in the second stage and a conveyor belt in the Technodrome. The Turtles also have different abilities in this game, which is going to take up more memory. I'm actually surprised that Ninja Turtles 3 is only 512 kilobytes. I thought it would have been more. These are among the biggest NES games, and there's not much after that 512 kilobyte threshold, but there's one game that's even bigger. Right at the end of the console's lifespan, Nintendo published Kirby's Adventure. It's a unique platformer. You can inhale enemies and copy their abilities. Certain abilities will be advantageous depending on the level design. There are secret switches you can find in some levels that let you unlock bonus content. These are not required, but it allows you to 100% the game. This title is a huge technological achievement. On paper, it doesn't seem that big because there's only 41 levels total, which is not even as many as Super Mario Bros. 3, but there's a ton of polish. There's multiple mini-games you can play, like the Egg Catcher one where you must grab the eggs and avoid the bomb. There's the Claw Machine game where you can win free lives, and a duel game where you must shoot first. The graphics have to be mentioned because not only does it look amazing, but because it must have taken up a lot of ROM space. Every pixel in this game is covered with some graphical detail and there's not a single blank spot. Even basic things we take for granted like the pause screen have some extra graphical detail. Every ability you grab in this game comes with a picture at the bottom. 
All of these things I mentioned are going to eat up ROM space very quickly. How much ROM space am I talking about? This game is a whopping 768 kilobytes. If we're being technical, there's a couple games that arguably don't count. The game Maxi 15 is 1 megabyte in size. Huge number, but there's an obvious reason for that. This isn't just one game, it's 15 games on a single cartridge. Of course it's going to be high in ROM space. Same thing with the game Action 52. Forgetting for a second that this game is terrible, the developer has really stuffed this to its absolute max. This is a 2 megabyte game. That's insane. If we're being technical, this is the biggest NES game ever made, but neither of these games should count because they're compilations. Are we done? Nope because the biggest NES game goes to a fairly unknown Japanese exclusive. In the late 80s, the company Hale began development on an adventure game. The company had made models of animated characters and wrote a script for the game, but the developers eventually realized that their game was too large to fit on a cartridge. Many sacrifices were made to get the game down to the ROM space allotment that the game would eventually be. The final game would use the MMC5 chip, which was very powerful, but also expensive. Nintendo even gave Hale a discount on the mappers just so that they could release it. The game would eventually be released in Japan under the name Metal Slander Glory and would take up a shocking 1 megabyte of ROM space. Less than Action 52, but remember, this is just one game. I wasn't sure what genre to expect. You would think this would be some impressive game that pushes the hardware limits, but it's actually just a text-based game with the artwork thrown in. Periodically, you're given a menu and you select an option. That's the whole game. The one megabyte of ROM space is because there's a lot of text and artwork throughout the game. The animation is good, and some of the cutscenes are cool, but I'm actually disappointed. The game honestly gets boring, and there's really nothing else to it besides just selecting options in a menu. Imagine what a one megabyte platformer, or a shooter, or a beat-em-up would have been like. Hale definitely bit off more than they could chew with this game. Metal Slander Glory would end up being too expensive for the company to handle, and it didn't help that the sales didn't make up for the high costs. Hale would end up nearly going into bankruptcy and would have to stop developing games on their own. Ever since, they've been closely affiliated with Nintendo. The Famicom started off with only 40 kilobytes of ROM space to work with, but with new technology, games could squeeze out 385 kilobytes, which gave us excellent titles like Super Mario Bros. 3. And we even have 512 kilobyte games like Ninja Turtles 3. Unfortunately for one title, the large size would end up being its biggest downfall. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.